So, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, BIC and Ravi, for hosting us. Uh, we are delighted to be here in Bangalore. And uh, the format is, uh, at this moment, I just want to talk a little about when we started the inequality report, not get into the substance of the report. We have then a two, three minute video which highlights the key findings of this year's report. And then I'm going to hand it over to Tara to moderate a stimulating conversation. I really hope that uh, we'll go back uh, with many more champions uh, in our struggle against inequality. So let me just talk of, uh, as most of you would know, Oxfam is a global confederation, works in 80 countries. Uh, in India, it's been uh, present since 1951. But for the last 10 years, uh, Oxfam started working on inequality as one of its central questions. And I would really say that in, in some ways, this was the civil society response to the, the massive gathering of the super rich with, I'm sure you've seen those shots of thousands of, uh, literally thousands of uh, uh, private jets coming to Davos. Uh, so it was the civil society response to actually uh, center stage what we thought were, was the central question uh, globally then. And, and I must say that uh, we started tentatively, but over the last 10 years, it's very clear that it is uh, an issue which is very emotive, but it also has enormous resonance. And that resonance is across party lines, across academics, and certainly with the common poor marginalized people of, of the entire world. So that's, that's how we have started. We really believe now, as Akshay was saying, that uh, inequality needs to be addressed if we are looking at reducing poverty and if we are looking at a just and sustainable future. So with, with that, if we could just see the highlights of uh, this year's report and then over to Tara. And I'm not sure after this, will we also get to see the audience a little, otherwise it's just a conversation amongst the three of us. Yeah. But after the video, maybe. Thanks. Yeah.
So I'm going to just quickly add uh, a little bit to what you've already read. I think the, the staggering data is with you. But let, let me just talk of a couple of data points uh, which certainly are dramatic and, and I feel fairly, to be honest, angry whenever I read that. This year, only 21 billionaires uh, have more wealth than 70 crore of Indian population, which is 50% of, of this country. And as I've been saying, put these 21 people in a minibus and they'll yeah. easily fit in a minibus. They have more wealth than 70 crore of Indian people. And, and this story has varied a little. Two years back, three years back in 2018, it was worse. There were only nine people who had more wealth uh, than 50% of the Indian population. So, so that's, that's the story. But I think what's also important for us to understand that this is a, a reasonably recent phenomenon. In the last 10 years, in the last one decade, and let me first give you the global figure, 50% uh, of the new wealth created in the last one decade went to the top 1%. 50% of that uh, wealth globally created. In the last two years, post-pandemic, or, or during pandemic and post-pandemic, two-third of that wealth, the newly created wealth, has gone to the top 1%. The story in India is not very different. In India, it's 40% uh, 40 of the newly created wealth has gone in this last one decade uh, to the top 1%. You know, the, the numbers are powerful, but let me just quickly talk of a specific uh, personal instance. Uh, I was traveling, I, I was in Latour uh, uh, for, uh, for some drought relief work. And uh, in, in uh, as, as you know, uh, that area goes through a fairly difficult time, and it was really a tough day. Met women who were walking several kilometers to just fetch water, and, and I did see livestock uh, uh, pretty much dying. And, and uh, then I was driving back, and that's the time when I connected with uh, P. Sainath. And, and he said, don't sleep when you're driving from Pune to Bombay. Keep your eyes open. And I did that, and, and I must say it was, it was a traumatic experience coming from that experience of that drought prone area with the hardships that I had seen. Uh, pretty much every five kilometers from Pune to Bombay, there were these billboards advertising uh, flats in a multi storied building with swimming pool in every flat, and then a massive pool uh, on top. So, this is, this is the level of inequality and, and visually, as in we have those pictures also, if you see those pictures of, of every flat with a swimming pool. And when you've seen people just getting drinking water after walking for, for uh, several kilometers. And you know, in, in some ways I also want to say that it's economic inequality, but it's inequality of multiple kinds. Access to resources is, is uh, uh, one more. So, very quickly, I know because I have to hand it over to Tara soon, uh, there are solutions also. You know, but first, let me just say that we do believe that we need to call out the hoax of trickle down. It does not work. And we find problematic that whenever we talk of inequality, <clears throat> people almost kind of uh, question us saying that why are you talking of inequality and not poverty? We think that it's unfair to juxtapose one against another. Poverty eradication is critical, but fighting inequality is one of those ways of poverty eradication, and, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about it. There are very clear solutions for it, and let me just quickly talk of three, uh, which were there, but, but it, one, is just the question of, of looking at uh, the tax architecture. We can introduce wealth tax. It's not that <clears throat> it's, it's a 
impractical idea. You have developed countries like Spain, Switzerland, Norway, which actually have a wealth tax. We have had a wealth tax till uh, 2016. So there are ways of looking at wealth tax, which is going to be very, very critical. And, and, and particularly during pandemic, Uruguay actually introduced a one-time uh, COVID tax. At this moment, there are three Latin American countries which are introducing wealth tax. So this is, this is a movement which is growing. And I think we need to really uh, address that. This is very, very critical because we do need significant investments in public education, public health, and other public services. There's, there's enough research which tells us that uh, wherever you have greater investments in public education and public health, those societies are more equal. And the third, I think it's, it's important to also talk of the working conditions of, of, of uh, the working class in this country. That we know 90% of the people are in the informal sector. Minimum wage is very often just on paper. In fact, uh, we know that uh, we lost our FCRA. You saw the first slide. Because of our work uh, around minimum wages, uh, we, we know that for sure now. Uh, so it's important to ensure minimum wages, and I would say not just minimum wages, to focus on living wages for everyone. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, those are three broad ideas that I think uh, are, are critical for us. Um, and and l let me just you know, end, because I think I would have uh, done my five, six minutes. So that when we are looking at inequality in this country, we will need to go beyond economic inequality. And let me just give you two more data points, I think which, which are very uh, uh, troubling. In 2018-19, in just the national capital region, there were 15 deaths happening every month just in the national capital region, uh, cleaning sewage lines. They were all all those 15, those manual scavengers were just from one caste. Just one caste. And they were all dying, 15 in, in the national capital region. And, and we still don't have any more human way of clean, cleaning our own shit. It is still the same caste which goes in and, and cleans those uh, lines. And, and finally, let's not forget uh, the child sex ratio in this country. We still don't have the census, sadly. I still, uh, I'm still waiting. I'm sure many of you are waiting. But the last census tells us that zero to six, we have only 916 girls for 1,000 boys. Whereas if, if uh, nature has its own way, then it's going to be 980 at birth, 975, 980 uh, girls for 1,000 boys. Amrita Sen calls them the missing millions. So let's look at the multiple dimensions of inequality. And if we need to create a just society, we'll have to address this head on. Over to you, Tara. What we will do today in this discussion, because you've heard the background of the report, many of you may have read the report. It's one of those topics where people find it hard to communicate. It's. Uh, the statistics are startling, and yet uh, it's the knowledge of it is not widespread, or the outrage that it deserves isn't forthcoming, right? Um, it's easier to outrage about corruption of a few crores in the building of roads, but we don't see the same outrage. You see thousands of people coming out in Bangalore to stop a flyover. You don't see the same outrage when people die cleaning, you know, manually scavenging. Part of the reason, I believe, is that even for those of us that feel for this, we have trouble communicating it. So one is we will focus on how do we bring this out in a way that people understand it and communicate it. The second thing the session will also do um, in understanding this and communicating this is also try to contextualize some of these things, the income disparities, the wealth disparity, and then all the other socioeconomic political uh, deltas in the context of 
current and past policies. How do we look at these policies and say, which of this exacerbated the problem, which of this helped alleviate the problem? And finally, we'll try to converge on the way forward and what we can do, right? So, <clears throat> if we look at the, the if we look at the, this story, the, the survival of the richest, um, basically it says, and for the people on the, um, on the podium, on the, on the stage, smart poor kids are less likely to graduate from college than dumb rich kids. This is, a, this is an American quote, so it's a very American way of saying this, right? But it's basically, and that's not because of the schools or colleges, that's simply because all the advantages go to the rich kids, right? This tells you everything. If you start a new college, um, if you start a new company at Sarjapur, those of us here in Bangalore are much more likely to apply to it and get jobs in it than those, you know, from Anikal or Ramnagra. And the same goes for colleges, the same goes for health, uh, a new hospital. Uh, there is an urban-rural divide, there is a man-woman divide, there is a caste-based divide, and of course there is an economic divide. This is all from Oxfam, and you can see what Amitabh said uh, very starkly, where if you look at the top 10, 1 to 10 percent, and the percentage of wealth they used to own versus now, you see a huge difference. The percentage of wealth to the bottom 50 percent has shrunk to under 3 percent. This is what Amitabh was saying. Whereas the top 10 percent own close to 75, even 80 percent of the wealth. Of course, population has increased. And the point I want to make is that it is not just that the wealth, the rich are getting richer. I think the worry is that the poor are getting poorer. It's okay if some people make money. The bigger problem is that the poor are getting poorer. This is an extremely perceptive thing to say about this whole inequality, which is that all the costs and risks of capitalism are shifted to those who work, the labor class, rather than those who invest. In other words, the returns are for those who invest, but the risks have gone to those who work. The returns go to those who put the most money into it but the risks are all borne by the labor class, whether it's the risk of recession, risk of not having health insurance, um, the risk of you know, having a pandemic, the risk of, if you take one week's leave, you slip into multidimensional poverty, is the case for close to 80% of women today, because they are in the informal labor force. Only 19% are in the formal labor force. One week of leave will slip them into multidimensional poverty. One week of lack of wages. So the Gini coefficient that measures wealth inequality as a 10 towards 100, we are getting to be an extremely unequal society. And this is something we need to keep in mind as we start to talk about this. And finally, I will say, how does this and why does this happen? Let's get an understanding of it before we talk about the actual inequalities. As new growth opportunities are created, the advantage goes to the rich, the male, the urban, the upper caste, the non-Muslim. I specifically say that because that percent of our population, whether it is gender, whether it is SESTs, whether it is Muslims, whether it is the poor, whether it is the rural, and whether it is the women, have a huge delta in social, economic, and political indicators. Women's representation in parliament today is a woeful 14%. Women's representation in Karnataka is much worse than the national average of, pathetic national average of 9%. And women's representation in Karnataka is worse. The more the power the position holds, whether it's a political position or an economic position, the less equitous it is. If you look at education, the equity between girls and boys is better than with higher education. By the time you come to earning and income, women make 64 paisa to men. And by the and SESTs is a huge gap for education, huger gap for wealth and income ownership, and even worse with political representation. The only representation SES, SESTs have is what is mandated by reservation. No reservation, no representation. So essentially, what's happening is that all the new opportunities are being taken by, you know, the a particular class of people, and hence you end up with more in inequality. Um, but I do want to conclude and start the panel, and this is the last slide, by saying that this doesn't mean growth is a bad thing. 
or people getting rich is a bad thing. It is necessary, it's just not sufficient. So really the question we're going to uh, try to ask ourselves is, how do we get both, right? How do we not, you know, how do we say it's, either, it's not either or? How do we get to both? So I'll start with uh, Professor Gowda since Amitabh um, made the opening comments. Um, I'll start with a simple question first. <laughs> <laughs> simple to you, Tara. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Ha you've kind of been on both sides of the fence, on the uh, academic side and the policy analysis side, and on the policy making side as a parliamentarian. Um, how much of inequality is in consideration or play as policies are devised in general, regardless of parties and governments? Is inequality even a thing? Are you even looking at um, if we come up with a certain scheme, right? How is it going to impact um, people equitably or how is it going to benefit those who um, are most marginalized? Is any of that under consideration as policies are discussed, as laws are discussed? Um, possibly there are two aspects to this answer. Uh, the first is that it doesn't seem to be an explicit election issue, right? So in that sense, people aren't going around saying, look at these 1%, um, 10%, they've cornered everything. We do see a certain amount of discourse in, in the context of crony capitalism saying, that, for example, that uh, two friends of the prime minister are cornering a lot of the nation's assets or something like that, and that their wealth has been increasing in uh, phenomenal uh, ways. But actually, if you look at the media headlines, it's a matter of pride that one of them has become the second largest, uh, second richest uh, uh, you know, man in the world or something like that. But actually, in terms of policy, political discourse, policy outcomes, there is a certain amount of attention paid to, um, to inequality. In what way? We bring these up. So for example, um, in the last two, three years, we've seen inequality strike us in a very, very stark manner. The first was the march, the long march of the migrants, right? When they, we were all sitting inside our homes, uh, you know, trying to shelter from the COVID virus. And suddenly we see that there are, you know, lakhs and lakhs of people walking a thousand kilometers home with no support, no food. You know, it was just um, in, your, in your face that there was another side of India that, you know, that um, we had tended to take for granted and we were not responding to. That's one side. And, um, and, and so there was a lot of clamor for um, urgent action for everyone who was being hurt by COVID. And then the government did respond. Of course, um, they claimed about, um, you know, they said they were giving the highest uh, rate of aid in the world, but when uh, in reality it was just a fraction of that. But regardless, those food um, provisions and other kinds of programs that were initiated then were addressing inequality and were trying to provide some kind of a social safety net in a very, very desperate moment. That was one side of it. But the other time when this issue keeps coming up all, uh, you know, always is in the context of indirect taxes, right? So we've been raising, and I mean, when I say we now, I'm speaking as an opposition politician, we've been raising the issue of um, taxes on fuel, for example, right? Basically saying the original compact was you raise the prices you know, when the market price goes up, and when it falls, you need to lower it and you know, let that windfall pass on to people. Now, forget windfalls. The basic point is that the government has kept those prices the same in terms of the retail consumer. Now, this actually has an impact on the farmer who uses diesel. It has an impact on inflation because it feeds into the general price level. And in the process, um, uh, you know, so we would clamor and say, look, why don't you cut this? Because then you would actually, you know, leave more money in people's pockets and they'd be able to cope with, um, you know, with inflation. They'd be, and, and, you know, there'd also be more money in their pockets may actually lead to more consumption and, uh, you know, sort of revive the economy, which was, which has been on a downhill uh, slope since demonetization, actually. Right? So these were some of the arguments, and there's not much attention paid to that because uh, the government is quite addicted 
to the excess resources that come its way through um, uh, excise duties and surcharges on fuel. The other part, though, is that, um, you know, the, for example, there was a point when uh, Prime Minister Modi in the Sabha, when I was there, uh, attacked the Mandrega program and said, this is a monument to your failures that in this day and age, to give you the context of what he was really saying, that in this day and age, you still need to give out a dole, right? And we're not giving out a dole, we're giving out essentially um, is a program that is um, a right, right? We're trying to empower. Livelihood, right to livelihood. Uh, right to livelihood. We're trying to empower, not uh, you know, give it out as charity, but saying, look, we realize that you have to, that you, know, you have a right to livelihood, and we are going to make that, make that work. Um, but then, this has been the program that has saved um, a large number of Indians in the last few years when they're trying to cope. So, and now you've seen um, uh, you know, some rationalization of how much food security would uh, go out. The, the temporary program has been expanded for another year. But if you actually think about the electoral discourse on these topics, in recent months, there's been a discussion on freebies and ravedies and things like that, right? Now, this is actually going the exact opposite direction that you would want as an empathetic nation. Right? We're basically saying, you know, we understand that there is essentially some kind of a K-shaped recovery. The rich have uh, done much better. You can see the sales of SUVs and things like that. After COVID, people, you know, possibly everyone in this hall is doing much better than, um, you know, people who live um, close by. But the point is, or the point is that um, you know, instead of creating a consensus around, you know, the fact that so many people are falling behind, one, there is denial, right? And with the lack of data of any kind, we have to rely on, um, uh, you know, data that comes out of an Oxfam report or something like that, which is, you know, very well timed, uh, <laughs> you know, with Devos and, uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But have you seen the kinds of, um, uh, you know, remarks that you get on Twitter? Uh, for this, okay? You will see that there's a whole uh, troll army that questions your patriotism and your integrity and everything else, right? They don't question the numbers. They don't look at the actual problem that exists below there. And so it's, it's, it gets lost in that kind of a discourse. So instead of saying, look, you know, there's no problem. Post-1991, there's an opportunity that's been created. And the inequality that comes from legitimate innovation and value creation is okay, but we have to take care of those who are falling behind. And instead of you know, putting that narrative forward, essentially uh, it's turned into, oh, these are freebies and you shouldn't give them out. At this point, we need a lot more of freebies or whatever else that the government needs to do to invest in health, education, um, I mean, basically ensure that the, um, you know, that the lower uh, uh, you know, quartiles are actually not, they don't have to worry about basic survival. Last point, um, you know, we used to talk about the UPA years and saying we brought 140 million people out of poverty. Post-COVID, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but we've seen people fall back into poverty with inflation being what it is. You're seeing people struggling to survive, and that's really that should be the main um, issue in elections going forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor Gowda talked about, you know, the migrants walking and it bringing, uh, bringing inequality, uh, you know, sort of smacking us in the face with inequality, which we sometimes get inured to. And when we see it at traffic lights, we just kind of ignore it because we're so used to seeing it, right? Those, those pictures of uh, the swimming pools that you were talking about, right? We are so used to seeing those things. We don't even, you know, we don't even worry about it. So, um, Amitabhji, the, how do you take something as abstract as inequality and then does it have, you know, it's an abstract thing. Okay, so what if there is, you know, uh, some people make more money than others, right? And so what if some people are more educated than others? Even if you took all the money that rich people had and handed it out, if you did some distributive, some simplistic version of distributive justice, uh, there's no guarantee it's going to stay that way. Uh, you know, tomorrow uh, things might change and slip back into wherever they were. 
how do you how do you show or how do you tell people or do you tell people that inequality impacts the unequal more than anyone else that the marginalized it is not just a number that the suffering is more than just the number we saw that with the migrants right it's not just that they are migrants and they are poor but when a pandemic hits they have to literally walk thousands of kilometers without water without food and reach their homes again to no food right no work and no savings so it's a multi whammy on the on poor right that that's the multi dimensional poverty bit right how do you how do you personalize these experiences so people actually feel them without a pandemic and seeing a lack of migrants walk because you work in the field right oxfam works in yeah. the field yeah so uh that it's it's good that we've talked of the the migrant workers and those heart wrenching images because i i think they're so important uh for us as a nation to keep at the center of our conversations while we are talking about economic growth and inequality because that's that's really the the face and as professor gora was saying i also don't remember the exact number but probably i remember ilo was saying that it's going to go up by poverty figures by almost 350 million people and sadly again we do not have poverty numbers coming from the government again so that's that's something that we are again and again saying that we do need uh, uh, numbers but but let me you know the point that you're making is is you know let me just say thank you for bringing in the the redistributive bit i think it's it's it is important that we bring in the redistribution question because what i was doing with uh say the newly created wealth where is it going it is going and it's lining the pockets of the super rich it is a rigged system it's a rigged economic system which essentially favors the super rich and that's that's what you talked of in in your circular diagram and and professor goda talked of of crony capitalism and sadly it's becoming fewer and fewer people in all this let me just give you you know the last report that we had also talked of vaccine billionaires it's important that during pandemic you had i i forget the number but a massive number including two from india who joined the dollar billionaire club during the pandemic and now let me just juxtapose this with what we have been doing with the health sector and just two three data points we are fourth from the bottom in a global list in terms of our investments in health we still hover around 1.25% of the gdp and and successive governments including the upa regime uh, did talk of 2 to 3% there's there's no disagreement it's almost like a political rhetoric all manifestos say 2 to 3% and it is stagnant at 1.25% we are at 1.25% uh sri lanka and nepal are 1.6% 1.7% our peers in brics are something like 3.8 3.9% south africa uh uh brazil uh russia and then you have norway etc almost at 9% we are just not willing to invest more let me also you know take it a little further because you are talking of 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 how people experience it and this is a startling number which people have not noticed that if you look at the human development index it says that uh, anyways we are 157th in terms of number of beds uh, available per thousand globally in a list of 167 countries we are 157th but what is more important and which which was startling for me also is that in 2010 you can take credit uh, it was 10 beds uh, sorry sorry 9 beds per thousand uh, of uh, the population and it reduced in 2020 to only 5 beds so it 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 also shows how we have starved and this includes all private beds government beds we have starved the public health system and we have obviously not compensated 
with uh, the private sector. Anyways, the private sector is beyond reach of the poor. Uh, so we also had data in terms of uh, people being able to access the, the, the several BIMA schemes that we are talking of. And, and the, there was very, very little access during pandemic. So the reality is that this inequality hits you. You are creating vaccine billionaires. You are creating the corporate uh, hospitals of the Apollos and of, of this world. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, you know, I find it obnoxious that we talk of medical tourism. People come from all over the world with the best doctors and the best facilities. But you have such a large number of people, young children dying of some very, very basic uh, diseases. So, so that's, that's the story I think we need to again and again highlight. People have to make that relationship that this is about challenging that, that economic system, which is very clearly just going to favor a few. You know, one thing that boggles me is that um, you talked about number of beds per capita, or number of beds per thousand, right? The number of beds per thousand in Gujarat is very close to the number of beds per thousand in Uttar Pradesh. It is that bad, okay? Whereas the number of beds per thousand in Kerala or Tamil Nadu are uh, comparable to what the United Nations uh, wants it to be. Where I'm going with this is that um, India is a nation of, in some ways, many countries, if you look at socioeconomically, right? Because Gujarat is 52% multidimensionally poor. Your report says that as well. Kerala has less than 1%. Tamil Nadu has less than 5% multidimensionally poor. So whatever schemes you're devising in Delhi are, cannot possibly fit both Bihar and, say, Kerala or, or Tamil Nadu. And Gujarat being one of the richest state or the richest state by GDP in the country, by per capita income in the country, it is strange that it has the uh, only as many beds as, as Uttar Pradesh. Very comparable. In fact, I think it's marginally worse. And this came out during the pandemic. So it tells me, uh, it makes me wonder if it is lack of political will investing in health and education. Because if Uttar Pradesh is capable of getting that many beds per thousand, despite being you know, one of the poorest states, uh, and Gujarat has been one of the richest states for a couple of decades now, um, and doesn't have the same, or Gujarat's maternal mortality ratio is very poor, for example. So that seems more about uh, political choices and policy making rather than absolute wealth or rich. And Gujarat is also a state where you have extremely rich people. Some of the billionaires you speak of come from Gujarat. So it is not as much about whether the revenues are flowing into the state, enough revenues, as to where they're being invested. It makes, makes me feel like that. And do you have any comments about that, uh, Professor Gaurav? So if you were to go a little deeper into Gujarat and look at the regional distribution, right, you'll find that Gujarat is a fairly urban um, uh, state and a lot of the wealth is concentrated there. And that's where um, um, power is concentrated as well. And they will, you will not find any shortage of uh, hospitals or access to medical facilities in those spaces. You probably see rural Gujarat, tribal Gujarat, as being, I mean, I'm, I don't know the exact answer to that. I'm just hazarding a guess here. That's where the um, inequality would be very, very stark. And um, there, there's multidimensional poverty in any case. And as a result, people are not demanding just this. They're demanding so many other things. And uh, some of it is finding its way into the budget, but most of it is not. So I think it's more a question about uh, who has the clout, who has the ability to get uh, you know, on the agenda. And um, um, the other uh, challenge is, if you actually look at, say, um, the healthcare, primary um, health uh, facilities and things like that, um, they have been increasing over time. Um, the quality of government services have been declining. And as a result, people, probably everyone in this hall, have seceded from the government system to, um, uh, you know, to private uh, medical care. Um, and again, the way uh, we've, you know, some of our states have had many more medical colleges uh, set up by non-government entities, 
right? But in many other states, including UP, that hasn't been the case historically. And as a result, the number of doctors that you produce is still very limited and nowhere um, uh, close to the kind of uh, you know, possibilities that would exist, demand. No, so there have been some in, in, you know, intelligent moves. For example, the, they used to have these ESI hospitals. You know, for a medical college, you need to have a hospital attached. Yeah. And I know that uh, you know, when Mr. Kharge was labor minister, from then on, they started uh, you know, creating medical colleges associated with that. Nursing college, there's one exists uh, right down the road here uh, with the ESI hospital. So what happens is we've got to come up with more imaginative ways of expanding supply and then finding ways to ensure that the supply actually stays in the country or goes into the countryside which doesn't happen very easily. So lots of uh, challenges like that. But um, yeah, but fundamentally, these are, you know, there, there is always, in, as you said, in our manifesto, we said 3% for health, 6% for education. And have we ever, or any government come anywhere close to that in reality? No. And uh, that's, that's a very, I shouldn't be laughing, it's not tragic. But the point is, that's really, um, that's what happens. This is an aspiration, and then we find that uh, the resources are not available or something like that. So one solution which can bridge his demand and, our, uh, and the necessity of what we need to do is to come up with the equivalent of a cess, which says, okay, we are taxing the wealthy, you know, but we're going to use that money for primary health care. We're going to use that to build hospitals. You know, something that clearly earmarks the, um, you know, then actually you'll probably find it much more politically saleable. If it's just a question of, um, uh, you know, of the kind of uh, uh, left rhetoric, that's what you would be criticized for, then I'm not sure it would sell uh, very easily in the current situation. But, you know, but even these cess, we've had an education cess forever. Yes. You know, where is that money going and yes. what's being done? Yes. We pay some kind of road-related cess. You know, as uh, have things transformed, we don't know. But uh, that's where accountability uh, initiative and others can give us some answers. But we are not in a very data-rich environment these days. Um, Amitabh ji, talk to us a little bit about, you know, your, the report talks of income disparities and wealth disparities, right? Income di disparities are a bit easier or more intuitive to understand because, you know, you earn less, you have less money to spend. Inflation hits you more because you're spending more money on, on food and essentials. And when those prices go up, it's an even greater percentage of your salary that goes towards that. And this, you know, is a vicious cycle. But you're talking about uh, wealth that one may not even have in a liquid form. Uh, you know, some people may have a few acres of farmland or somebody else, you know, may have a couple of homes that they are renting out somewhere, right? Um, and you know, how does wealth matter? Is income all that matters? And we can't bestow people with wealth, right? So it's a generational thing. You, some of it is inherited. And uh, so how, can you talk to us about how wealth actually impacts inequality? Is it like collateral, loans, you know, access to capital? Where does wealth play a big role in inequality? Other than absolute numbers, yes, somebody is, you know, has uh, inheritance worth 100 crores and somebody else has no inheritance at all. Other than a number, how does it materially impact inequality in daily life? So, uh, first just going back to what you had said to Professor Gorda, and, and thank you for saying that, it is a political choice. Inequality is certainly not inevitable. It's a, clearly a political choice regimes make. There are ways of addressing it, and they shy from addressing that. So I just wanted to kind of not lose that thread. Absolutely. Uh, of, In fact, of, the of Gini coefficient said. differs between states. The states with huge inequities and states where exactly. inequities are far less. And, and there is reasonable evidence to tell you that it is a political choice. Coming to your, your question, uh, again, in terms of generational wealth, intergenerational wealth, we do talk about also inheritance tax. And I think it's, it's important. Even, even in a country like US, you have uh, inheritance tax of, of different kind, which at least ends up uh, making people uh, form lots and lots of philanthropies. Uh, that's, that's their way of evading it. 
There, there are problems with philanthropy also. Hopefully we can talk about it because I've, I've heard this weird argument that don't go after the super rich people in this country. They're ultimately giving so much money back to the country. It's, it's, it's not about their desire to give back. We are talking of uh, the state's ability to get resources from them. So coming back to your question again on income, you know, I would say one in India, it's important to acknowledge that we're not getting again the income data. Otherwise, we would certainly be looking at it. As in look, look at uh, what Thomas Piketty has done. And he's essentially telling us, and, and that's again an important fact, that from independence till the late 80s, you were looking at a trend of moving towards a more equal society. And then you suddenly start looking at uh, 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 much more of uh, inequality. So having said that, I think wealth is multiple things. It's, it's, it's a conceptual question that I'll, I'll need to engage with, but it certainly is about capital. It is about assets. It is also about political clout, uh, which then changes the government policies. And that's where the cronyism comes in. And we've talked of it in some ways, the vaccine uh, bit that I was talking of, vaccine billionaires, is essentially a story of, of that. So in no way our report would say that don't look at income inequality. That's, that's also critical. But wealth completely changes uh, the ground on which we are having this conversation. And I, I think that's, that's something very, very uh, uh, critical. And, and you're giving the example of wealth, uh, you know, breeding more wealth. But I'd also like to highlight for the audience that today, if you want a simple educational loan without collateral, if you're most of the population doesn't own, own anything, right? They don't own land, they don't own a home, right? And uh, if you want an educational loan for an undergraduate degree without collateral, you can't get it. You simply can't get it. You can get tens of thousands of crores and run away without paying the public sector banks, but you cannot get a four lakh loan an auto driver without a home cannot get a full lakh home to full lakh loan to fund her daughter's undergraduate studies, right? So there's a difference between theory and practice here. Uh, you know, in theory you can. In practice, the banks are not giving those loans out. They're very worried about NPAs, uh, you know, in terms of student loans, rather than the bigger ones that are uh, waved off. But um, but actually, the policy exists that you can um, get student loans without without collateral? Uh, below, a, so below four lakhs and not for undergraduate degrees. Yeah, so I, I checked the SBI site before I came here and uh, it has to be a small amount and not for undergraduate degrees. But these are real, uh, you know, real uh, impacts of inequality on the lower end of the population and the re which is the majority of the population. And uh, the reason I'd like us to focus on that is because I think it brings out empathy in us and the need to fix it. Um, whereas the focus on the rich getting richer is, brings out um, anger, brings out uh, perhaps envy, I don't know. But it's also difficult to fix, right? Because in some sense, doing well is human aspiration. And um, asking governments to fix it is a two-pronged issue. We should ask, the question is, how do we ask to make it happen? It's a two-pronged issue, right? One is uh, political parties get their donations from the super rich. So by asking them to go after the super rich, you're basically cutting off party sources of funding, and they're never going to do it. This is one of those things. This is like the women's reservation bill, women's representation that we've been fighting for for years, right? For women to get in, men need to lose their seats. Men don't want to lose their seats, right, Professor Gowda? So, <laughs> so you won't get it. So it's the same story with um, you know, taxing the super rich, which is the very governments that need to pass the bill are the ones that are reliant on the money that comes from these donors. Uh, and so it's very diff difficult to get, it, get that going. But that doesn't mean we don't do it. We have to make it happen in other ways that are sort of the pill has to be sort of provided more. Just a line, as you know, I hear you. But let me also say that um, I think in the public domain, uh, what is the public morality? I think we need to bring the question of inequality into that conversation. 
we cannot shy away from that conversation. And, and we as Oxfam do believe that uh, adding the number of billionaires the way we are adding is a sign of failure and not success. I think it's important to underscore that. Uh, particularly in a year when, uh, as Professor Gora was reminding us, according to own government's admission, 70 to 80 crore people were essentially surviving on thanks to the, the right to food that was given. Yeah. So in that, you're talking of adding new billionaires and, and, and the, the entire media to our, our dinner Thanks. conversation, yeah. the frenzy. I think we need to fundamentally look at, uh, you know, it is a moral question. It's not just an economic and a policy question. It is a moral question that we must come back to. And, and you know, just to, I keep, uh, uh, Medha ji, Medha Patkar and I were together in some, uh, some panel and she said, Garibi rekha hataiye, amiri rekha banai. It's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, uh, I just wanted to jump in on the concept of mobility, right? You know, right in the preamble, we have equality of status and of opportunity, yeah. right? We discussed, you know, we understood that multidimensional uh, aspects of uh, poverty and lack of mobility. Now, if you actually look, you'll start to see that the labor force participation rate is falling. People are discouraged. They're not even thinking about going to work, trying to find a way out of uh, the current predicaments that they're in. So this is really a very, very sad state of affairs. And we need to turn that around. And, um, uh, you know, and, and basically, the dimension that uh, you have so many people doing better. In a city like Bangalore, for example, where we celebrate unicorns, uh, uh, you know, essentially, that is inspiring a large number of youngsters to come in and set up startups and things like that. So in, in some ways, that has a place. But a lot of this wealth, uh, you know, when, the counter argument has always been that wealth gets invested, investment creates jobs, and increases incomes for much larger numbers of people. We haven't seen that. Corporate tax cuts recently have not resulted in greater private investment. There's some change happening right now. Um, others would argue that inequality itself is a phase, right? 1991, we liberalized the economy. We unleashed entrepreneurial energy. So some people would do much better. Those who didn't have the advantages would fall behind. But once we put in enough investment in health, education, uh, social safety net, et cetera, when they don't have to worry about survival, then they can start and we give very good access, then they would turn uh, things around and start moving forward. But none of those have actually happened. And that's the uh, tragedy. And so people are not even thinking about mobility or work or, or, you know, or how to pick themselves up and move forward. They, you know, this is especially the case with women who are, um, you know, women's labor force participation is abysmal in this country. Hmm. And you know, the, to, to your point, uh, Amitabhji and Professor Gowda, while the government tends to celebrate, you know, we've created this many billionaires or, you know, this many unicorns, if we also acknowledge the stark data on inequality, on multidimensional poverty as much, not just the grandeur and releasing a, a Niti Aayog report, or, which itself calls out the, the, you know, really shocking state of multidimensional poverty there is, uh, or the State of Inequality Report that was released in 2022 by the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, but you, which is exactly what Oxfam is also saying, that there is a horrendous state of inequality, but then one gets attacked. So the fact that to the extent that data exists, we refuse to acknowledge what government needs to do. In a sense, the people in this room don't even need government, right? We, we can afford to rent or buy our homes. We can buy water. We, have, we live in places that probably have a generator. We send our kids to private school. We wouldn't step inside a private hospital. We, other than using roads, right? We really don't use public amenities at all. So our job, in a sense, is to argue for the money to go towards those who need it so that the rest of society as a whole can progress, right? But like uh, uh, Amitabhji was saying, the way we celebrate the, what is deemed as success, the billionaires, we don't celebrate, we don't acknowledge our failures and we don't 
sort of act on it. Every time there is a new uh, government in Karnataka, at least in the recent uh, years, we have had the chief minister call upon uh, the first meeting the chief minister takes is typically with a group of people, do you know who is typically composed of that group? The very first meeting. It's usually the top billionaires in the city, the industrialist, to help plan and set out a vision for governance of the next five years. If you've never walked, never had to rely on public water, public electricity, sanitation, um, and you're setting out, you're the only ones providing input. It's important to take input from everyone, hence representative democracy. But if you're the only ones providing input, then we will end up having inequalities. And it's indeed, that is the case. So um, we will now get into sort of uh, summary comments. I think there's about five minutes per person. Um, so that's how the agenda is set up. <laughs> Um, you're welcome to, you know, talk about, or if you want to continue the discussion, I'm, I'm good with that too. I'm, I'm happy to continue the discussion. Okay, all right. Uh, you too, Professor? Yeah. Okay. So how about we actually talk about, uh, so, you know, go, going forward from there, I just gave an example of the Karnataka government. Uh, we see that governments take measures like the recent uh, Delhi MCD elections. You saw AAP make an announcement that said, uh, we are, you know, exhorting RWAs to vote for them and saying that they will actually divest funds, right, uh, into RWAs. Now, this has no constitutional basis on the one hand, but on the other hand, this is exactly what uh, the Oxfam report is talking about, which is that the privileged, the Delhi is, you know, is known to have a horrendous number of slums and a horrendous number of people that are stuck in, you know, the, the poverty cycle, migrants especially from around uh, the states that live around Delhi and elsewhere, and yet we see election promises and subsequently the fulfillment of those promises. In Punjab, uh, we saw the promise around, you know, 2,000 rupees for every woman or, or something like that. This is not for women below poverty line. This is not even uh, more education for women or jobs or pulling them out into a sustainably, you know, uh, you know self-sustaining state. It is, you know, we'll give you money temporarily to keep you in this situation because that 2000 is going to vanish in no time, right? Um, how do we get governments out of this rut between the election cycle and the short term five year? How do we get out of this rut of promising things that actually worsen this inequality? The RW1 uh, is a real, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right about privileging the privilege. And Delhi RWAs have a um, long history of gating their entire neighborhoods and what is essentially, you know, public roads are all um, uh, gated communities. Uh, that's what has happened over time. Very, very exclusionary. But, um, you know, AAP uh, succeeds in Delhi partly because they have a, a substantial support base amongst the poor. But they also came, uh, you know, they rose to power or rose to prominence with a lot of uh, middle and upper class support and uh, during the, uh, you know, India against corruption movement. And uh, so this is probably a way of sort of, um, you know, making sure that that audience is, um, continues to be happy. But there's a, uh, you know, it, so it would really be very inequitable if this kind of um, promise is actually fulfilled. On the other hand, there's a larger problem with uh, local government and local governance not having enough resources at all because the most uh, most urban bodies are dependent yeah. on state on state grants to they don't have enough uh, revenues that they raise on their own so that's one problem now this um, uh, you know the 2000 rupees per woman the Karnataka Congress has just announced that as our second promise as well. Uh, so along with uh, free electricity but you know the argument here would be look Stop calling these freebies. These are ways of um, empowering people with something that can make a difference. And, uh, and uh, the whole argument about giving it to women has this uh, basis that, uh, that all of us uh, men would blow it up on booze or something like that. And that uh, my women issue is not that women get families, money. Uh, would take care of their families. That's not it. No, no. But so there are a lot of um, uh, programs which are targeted towards women including direct benefit transfers, um, you know, a variety of them are done in that manner. But 
the amounts are still small, but in the current um, inflation scenario, even 2,000 rupees is, you know, is a boost in some ways. Yeah. No, I, I have no doubt that, uh, you know, given the abject poverty of people, that the, the money will be well put to use. That is not the issue here, or even the necessity of it. My issue is after 70 years, we still have 16% female labor participation rate in the formal workforce, absent doing anything specific to improve really, uh, you know, sustainable ways of reducing this inequality. Uh, while this 2000 is a temporary sukkah, from you know tomorrow's need to pay the school fees, it doesn't materially change inequality in, in any way, right? So uh, I'm not saying it's not necessary, I'm simply saying that not enough is being done beyond that. Uh, labor force participation rate has only fallen, it hasn't risen, right? Women's wealth has not risen despite the Hindu uh, family law being modified to, you know, for inheritance, co parsonry and so forth. So we have, Clearly, these policies are not sufficient. They may be necessary, but they're not sufficient. But Amitabh ji, if we look at the Oxfam report, a lot of what you're recommending is in the tax realm, to say, let's tax the rich, right? Do you think that's all there is to it? If you tax the rich, like I was saying, Gujarat is flush with money, has serious HDI problems, right? Whereas you take a state like Andhra Pradesh that is uh, you know, far less in terms of uh, per capita income or the GDP of the state, uh, but certainly shows better human development indicators than some of the richer states, than say Maharashtra, than say Gujarat. So, but Oxfam tends towards, let's do more taxation, right? That's the answer. I, I think that's the more uh, attractive story for the media. Uh, but uh, we do talk of other things. But let, let, let me just, before that, because you talked of gender, in the top 100 billionaires, there are only seven women. Of that, two are women who have uh, clearly inherited uh, Mrs. Jindal and uh, uh, Ketan Parikh's uh, wife. So only five in the uh, top 100. Uh, I would say, you know, you, you, we do need to, when we start looking at inequality, we need to look at multiple layers. So taxation is one part of the story. As I said, uh, very important driver is investment in public health and uh, public education and other services. And let me link that to uh, the labor force participation. I think we just don't have early childhood care in this country. Yes. We don't have for care working for women. Uh, elderly. And who eventually does this? It's the women. Yes. So unpaid care work is again one of the drivers of inequality. If you don't recognize unpaid care work, we're not going to be making changes. So in, in some ways, because you've talked of multiple things, I talked of minimum wages, let's move minimum wages to uh, living wages. ILO is talking about it. How can we still calculate minimum wages where people will have to lead a life of indignity? It has to be a living wage where anybody can live a life of dignity. As in, if, if that's the kind of wealth we have in this country, what we've been talking of, let's at least ensure uh, that people have uh, a living wage. And, and we were talking of the migrant workers. I am surprised that a lot of these billionaires were very surprised when the migrant crisis happened. And I've heard this firsthand. Uh, fortunately, some of them are doing some actions. Uh, in, in Pune, in Mumbai, particularly some Parsi billionaires who have come together, they said, oh, we didn't realize that people working in our workforce don't have a place to live in these cities. They, they did not really understand the problems the supply chains have. So, so there, there's a whole range of actions that would be needed. And in that, I think, coming back to what is really the, the political will. And at this moment, how do we look at democracy in this country? A, a, a democracy where basic welfare for the poorest of poor is seen as ravery is hugely problematic. As in the kind of, this is not the social contract. The rich and the super rich obviously have seceded from this country. Uh, you forgot about the private guards. You talked of everything. Yeah. So you even have your own private security. They have seceded. They're just using roads, and very soon they will be using their choppers also. 
so it is a fundamental question of how democracy functions. It is a question of that social contract. Is welfare state going to be central to a country where you have these levels of poverty? So I, I would really, you know, ultimately we need to go back to the questions, the work that you do, the fantastic work you do of, of representational democracy. How, how does democracy work? Is it really a democracy that we're looking at at the moment? Or is it oligarchy or certainly a crony capitalist uh, state? So you know, j just to end, uh, some of those uh, people who work on democracy who are saying from a welfare state, we moved to a regulatory state, and we are now at the level where it's a predatory state. Actually, the Oxfam report caused me to think about what we can do to force state to look at this, right? Because what I don't believe, Professor Gowda, is that over a period, quote, you know, this is the most famous statement you hear, quote, over a period of time as education, educational access improves as more people, you know, gain, uh, gain education, things will change, right? That is one thing I firmly refuse to believe because, for example, women's political participation hasn't even changed by one percentage point. Has it even changed by one woman a year? In 75 years, if one woman a year extra had gone to parliament, we would have 75 women in parliament, right? So we don't. So <laughs> it's, that, it's that bad. So things don't automatically change. State needs forcing functions. Otherwise, state kind of caters to those that have the greatest power and influence. So one thing the Oxfam report caused me to think about is to say, how do we create that forcing function? As a campaigner, I'm always thinking about how do I create that forcing function? How do I make it palatable to state? Because what we want as citizens is not exactly what state wants, because they have their own forcing functions. And one thing I could think of was this rara over GDP basically papers over things like inequality. It papers over the fact that you can have jobless GDP growth, right? Which is exactly what has been happening in a bit. So instead of having multiple indices, um, like the UN uh, has the, uh, U the UNDP has the various SDGs, right? Instead of having the multiple indices, if the experts could come up with a single weighted index that includes the GDP, a composite index that includes the GDP, includes jobs creation, includes the key, you know, health and education indices, like health itself can be condensed to just two or three things, maternal mortality, infant mortality, and nutrition rates basically tell you everything you need to know. If those three are good, the state's doing well as far as public health is concerned. That's all that matters because if women are healthy, babies are healthy. If babies survive the first five years, are vaccinated, then they don't have, and are getting the nutrition, they don't have malnutrition, right? That means your ICDS is working, your noon meal schemes are working. So it tells you a lot. Similarly, education has only a couple of indices to worry about. Gross enrollment ratio, and you know, the rate at which women and SE, STs are, are, are graduating. If we could come back female labor force participation, if we could come up with a composite index that included all this, you don't have a Gujarat-like situation where you have fantastic uh, per capita income and you know, unreasonably poor human development indices to go with that, right? So, yeah, so that's something that occurred to me. S to start with, let's not lampoon indexes like uh, the hunger index. You know, we, we need to at least acknowledge what we have. And what you're saying, you have the human development index, which in broadly does capture uh, what you're saying. But let me also say that you know, there, there are several states which are trying to think of alternatives. Yeah. How robustly? I'm not so sure, but look at, uh, and people say it's too small a state, uh, country, but Bhutan, the idea that we'll not talk of GDP, we'll actually talk of happiness index. Uh, can we substantiate that? Uh, look at New Zealand as an all power to the, now the prime minister was, you know, amazing, never, never heard of, of a prime minister saying that I don't have enough uh, in the tank. Fuel in my tank. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but uh, in New Zealand, she introduced the well-being budget. So it's, it's essentially about well-being. It's not about economic growth. So this, this obsession with economic growth is also a problem. It is, it, you know, the needle has to move towards uh, human development. And I think that's, that's a reasonably comprehensive uh, index that we can use.
Okay, I've been told it's time for Q&A, so hopefully uh, we have a reasonable amount of time for that. Any questions? Okay, um, one, two, three. Mic. There's a mic there? Or? Oh, that is the mic. Okay, so please uh, do come forward and uh, would you raise your hands again? I just want to get a sense of how many questions. Okay, so we can do even one by one, at least for now. Please come forward, start to come forward. So my question is to Amitabh. I think, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm apologizing in advance. I'm going to say something that you may not like. Two things that I found not so good in what you said. We don't need more billionaires. I think you need more billionaires, but you need to figure out how you get the money from those billionaires down to the poor. So I think that's number one. Second, I think your, the, the take home that I got, I have not read your report, but even Tara alluded to that, that you talked of taxation. Sure, tax the rich, but how are you going to make sure that 40% of that tax doesn't go into uh, you know, undesirable means? And if you can't ensure that, then don't tax the rich. Can you come up with more innovative ways like CSR, which sort of forced money from so-called rich to things that they wanted to contribute? I think you'll have to spend more time in thinking of solutions rather than just tax. Do you want to comment on it, Amitabh Ji or uh, Professor Gowda? Uh, we'll take a couple more questions. Sir. Uh, my question is that how do we reduce inequality in a society which is inequal by design? So caste system, I think it's one of the most sophisticated forms of inequality ever seen in the world. And uh, I, although I'm not a student of social sciences, uh, but throughout India's history, we have seen that we, are, we, have, remained we have remained historically inequal. It's only the, uh, the period from 47 to, let's say, the late 80s wherein we actually thought of turning into a socialist state. So I think it's, uh, you can say, it's, uh, it's a rewind of what, whatever has happened in the last 2,000 years, uh, like playing around. So that's, that's my question. Um, so I've gone through the report and uh, the panel discussion, wonderful panel discussion that we just had. Uh, Mr. Gorda here said that the troll army doesn't question the numbers, the stats, but your patriotism, that's unfortunate. So well, I'm here to question the numbers. Uh, the definition of wealth that Oxfam uses, right, it's uh, assets minus liabilities, which is taken from Forbes and Credit Suisse, both organizations that use it for a very different purpose, to understand comparisons among top 1%. Now, what it does is that according to Oxfam data, there are more poor people, not just in percentage, but in absolute numbers in North America and Europe than in China, which is very absurd. Uh, to put it into perspective, an HBS grad who just graduated has definitely, uh, you know, is living a much better life than a landless liberal in Bihar, in my home state Bihar, is poorer than that landless labor. And that, to me, is intellectual dishonesty. Now, the reason Oxfam uh, has this specific definition, I understand from, again, I'm attributing it, uh, is because Oxfam here doesn't, doesn't want you to know that not just poverty, but also global income inequality has been going down for the last 10, 15 years. Um, and uh, again, I'm not even going into the completely flawed data on the GST. I think that has been flagged. Uh, maybe some of you have read the reports. If not, uh, then perhaps go uh, read it. Um, uh, another thing I just wanted to ask, if just in, in 30 seconds, is that one of the recommendations here in the report is to impose a tax on unrealized capital gains. Now, should the government compensate or return the money when that unrealized gains turn into unrealized losses? Thanks. I think we can answer these and then take more. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the first comment, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. so, you know, I, I would not get into a contest on, on the billionaire's bit. That's, that's uh, something I do believe, that it is a reflection of, uh, at the moment, clearly that we are not distributing wealth adequately. Uh, so that's something that, that's, uh, that's our understanding, and we're giving the numbers for that. Uh, CSR, we have seen that the CSRs have not worked effectively. 
there's huge problems with that. However, I completely take your point that when you tax the rich and when you have a greater uh, revenue for the government, we do need to enhance the uh, state capacity. There's absolutely no doubt about it. There's absolutely no disagreement on it. But let me also just add one more figure that at this moment, if you let's just look at the tax GDP ratio, India is just 11 or 12 percent. Again, if you look at our peers, uh, South Africa is something like 23, 24 percent. Brazil is 25 percent. And again, Norway, Sweden, Canada are 40 percent, which ensures that the state has enough resources for investments into the public services that we think are fundamental drivers of an equal society. So that's, but I take your point, there are huge investments in state capacity needed instead of what we are currently doing according to us is actually further shrinking the state capacity. But the first one, as I said, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, that, that's a matter of uh, uh, opinion. Amitabhji, the one other thing I'll add is this is also because India is moving more and more into an indirect tax regime, which means that you are actually taxing the poor as much as you're taxing the rich for a large set of things. Uh, and because we all pay the same tax regardless of our income and wealth background, that means that the poor suffer more, but the money is not necessarily plowed back in, into them because again, you're cutting corporate taxes, right? So, and, uh, and income tax also has, has changed over time. So I think there's the, there is the, should we be slamming people for being rich and should we be taxing them? It's a human aspiration to make money. That is one side of the story. But the fact is we've actually uh, uh, reduced taxes, right? We've actually reduced both corporate taxes and personal taxes on the rich while we are tax increasing GST. So there's actually a shortfall we've created for ourselves, which we are making up by taxing the poor through GST increases. Okay, yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, the po poverty, uh, sorry, the, the wealth numbers, yes, we take it from the Forbes list and the Credit Suisse list. You know, my request to you would be that uh, let's have a conversation and I'll come to the, uh, the, the flawed data question uh, because I think that's more substantive. Where do we take our numbers from? That's the, those are the numbers that we get. Please have a look at any other um, wealth data. And, and I'm very happy to engage with that conversation. If you come up with conclusions saying that we don't have an unequal society, I'm very happy to engage with that conversation. That's not what, what we are seeing. And therefore, I think the, the substance of our report is to bring attention to the question of inequality. And, and let's have a discussion on that. And we've talked of how it can be addressed. In terms of the flawed data on, on GST, uh, there are three different pieces in that. One, that the data has not been provided uh, after 11 and 12. So it is old data, yes, and we acknowledge that. B, people have not questioned what we have talked of in terms of the, the tax burden, in terms of the percentage of the income. That's also, it's fairly clear, it's, it's, people would understand and appreciate that at a, the lower bottom 50% are gonna have a much greater tax burden than the, this, the rich because of just the income disparity. And, uh, and the third, in terms of uh, uh, the percentage of the 64%, there is a list, please have a, a look at the report. We clearly say it's a specific list which has a, a poor bias and that's what we have used to highlight uh, the, the bias in terms of the GST architecture. So those are the numbers, and happy to give you more details. You can talk to me bilaterally or one of my colleagues. Yeah. There was a question on caste. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that has been, you know, uh, the constitutional compact right from the beginning has been to recognize that there are these barriers that, um, uh, you know, that have disadvantaged entire communities for millennia. And that's why you have reservations initially for Dalits and Adivasis, and now, of course, for a much larger section of the population. The approach, of course, is that education would be the 
liberating force. And <clears throat> to some extent that has happened. You have a lot uh, better representation. But um, uh, you know, the way things have been evolving, the same inequalities, uh, you know, access to private education, things of that sort, have uh, resulted in a situation where um, very, very large numbers of people are not even able to get access to the, uh, you know, the liberating force. So in some ways, if we were to look for some, you know, if you were to think about all these uh, startups and the, uh, you know, whatever they're working to solve, a better solution would be to pump in resources into maybe something that focuses on providing much better access to quality education to more people using technology, you know, something like that. Because that would, you know, if you, um, uh, when, when people question caste-based reservation, you know, there have been studies which say that, okay, drop caste, just stick to two dimensions. If you are rural, and if uh, the kind of school you're, uh, uh, the kind of school that you're coming from, and the and your parents' background and education, and right with just those two factors, you'll be able to see who is massively disadvantaged compared to the others. But you'll start to see that this caste uh, dimension is there. In you look at the list of billionaires and see what caste they come from. You know, there is so much inherited asset knowledge and capability that is passed on. The, there is a sense of what is possible for a large number of, number of people that, um, uh, you know, that doesn't exist for most who are just worried about survival. So it's a very complicated process, but we're trying to destroy those um, historic injustices in, but by using caste to destroy caste. You know, that's what um, uh, the reservation system is all about. And you can see how controversial that has become in, you know, urban, uh, upper caste dominated India in some ways. Okay, I'll stop there. Let's and take a whole bunch of questions yeah. possibly. Um, yeah. The one other comment I'll make about caste is, yes, caste is entrenched and we have an equality problem in India as a result of it. Um, absolutely, no two ways about it. As are other things like gender. But the fact is, even countries that don't have caste, even you know that beacon of capitalism, the US or other countries like the UK have huge inequality problems. They are struggling with inequality even after hundreds of years of democracy. They have huge income inequality, wealth inequality, every possible access to education, access to health inequality, longevity, everything is, is indexed on, on. They're struggling with some of the same problems. So this is, uh, democracy is skewed by money, right? That's the fundamental issue. And uh, I, all I would say is the more we get governments and government policy to spend resources on the have-nots than the haves, the more we're going to be addressing this problem. Uh, good evening. Uh, so my work has been mostly around data and policy. And I have two points. First question uh, is that uh, when we look at social protection schemes, if we look at Indira Gandhi, uh, a widow pension scheme or disability pension scheme, it's like 300 per, uh, per month or 500 per month. So given that, um, so my first question is that, is it infl inflation index? Because how I see is uh, my one time vegetable shopping cost me this much or any Indian average household for that matter. So um, like, is it enough given that um, how inflation is rising? Two, given the pool of resources that we as a country can generate by taxing the rich. My uh, second question, uh, second uh, is not the question, but actually a point that when we talk about marginal communities, we talk about women, we talk about caste, religion, and also in terms of occupation, that is manual scavenger, as you discussed. But we uh, often forget the disabled population. So World Bank hi uh, highlights that 15% of, the, uh, of uh, the world has dis disability. And India's census 2011 stats say that it's 2.2%. Though there's this whole uh, research around it, how, it's, how there is gap and all of that, but we still don't consider that population as significant because they also can be a major contributor in the economy. They can contribute significantly to GDP if we talk about that. So uh, what could be um, the role of CSOs or uh, for that matter, the role of citizen to uh, bring that question up? Thanks. Uh, based on some experience, I have some requests for uh, Oxfam. 
Uh, ever since I watched those migrants walking, I've been studying the subject of inequality, and I'm trying to understand what causes inequality, specifically. And one of the things that uh, I found was that uh, the contract labor, for instance, in the blue chip uh, corporate sector is paid one fourth or one fifth for doing the same work. And I have worked, and actually I have uh, administered this, so I can talk about from personal experience. The Contract Labor Act says equal pay for equal work. And through my RTIs, I found that it is not enforced at all. Now, as a result, we really don't have enough information as to what leads to inequality and what are the prominent causes of inequality. Oxfam data is excellent at the macro level, but not sufficient at the micro level. So my only request is that if you can put out, you know, these specifics and uh, concrete pieces uh, on which people like me can work, uh, we would be highly grateful. Thank Thanks, you so Devari, sir. He runs the Bangalore Environment Trust and is a very well-known, well-respected. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, this is Sudha. Namaste. Thank you. And it was great listening to you all. Um, so I, I have, I, this is one of my favorite topics, right? I have too many questions. I'll try to keep it minimal. So whenever I try to ask the question that I'm going to ask, uh, I'm called privileged. So before that, I would like to state my background, where I come from. I belong to a scheduled caste, and uh, we our uh, financial background was pretty lower middle class. So we had basic necessities. We always had food to eat, place to stay, and my dad always ensured like we are educated and stuff. Um, but my mom, I have seen my mom sacrificing her food for all of us. If you see, like, she never used to eat a lot of curry. I used to ask her why. She used to ask, I don't like it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the background I come from. So. Uh, I want to ask one question. Ki, um, so, uh, two questions. I'll keep it simple. Do you think poverty is a state of mind? And my second question is, uh, why are so many graduates from IITs and IIMs are leaving India? Why are they uh, staying there? So, I ask this question to all of my friends who try to go there. And uh, their answer, uh, modesty, right? So they, they answer freedom. What freedom? You can't even walk in the middle of the road. You don't know who is going to shoot you when, what freedom is it? So they're going for money, right? So how, how are we going to deal with this? The brightest of minds are leaving the country. So how, how are we going to deal with it? How can we include a more of an, you know, entrepreneurs in the journey who, who, you know, can provide jobs to millions of people, to so many people, create great stuff? Like, how can we make that happen? You know, just focusing, saying that education, education, education. We are the most literate people and the, sorry to say, least educated people, <laughs> I feel. So, you know, whenever something happens, even in case of very simple thing like Sushant Singh Rajput's death, so nobody talked about mental health. It was all Riya Kardia, okay, his, his ex did that. They gave drugs to him. He's a baby or what? Like, what is this? We never focus on the actual issues. We are always, you know, are running around some other things. So yeah, um, that's it for me as of now. So uh, it was great listening to you. I would like to connect in person later. Thank you. Katyani ma'am. Katyani ma'am runs Civic and they've been doing yeoman service on inequality actually. So yes ma'am. I've worked with her for two decades or more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, my question is that most political parties they are resorting to announce uh, freebies, 2,000 rupees, uh, you know, things like that. But they don't seem to have an agenda for how to increase employment. You know, you say it's the greatest problem is unemployment, but I hardly see any party with a constructive agenda for how to increase employment. And uh, the other problem is that I respect what you said about giving a living wage. but. Uh, that's the easiest way to bring about, you know, um, lessen the inequality. But if you think, if you understand that uh, more than 90% people are working in the informal sector in MSMEs, and MSMEs themselves are dying, so how do you expect them to pay a living wage? You know, living wage today is probably about 30 rupees, 30,000 rupees per month for a household. And, uh, 
they can no way support that. So if the government wants to increase minimum wage also, you have the employers going to the court and getting a stay order on such uh, increases. In So you will find that the government has fixed minimum wages that are less than half a living wage. In Karnataka, it's about 10,000 rupees per month. So by, and also they fix the lower minimum wage because they say otherwise, if you pay to, so much to one worker, the others will not be able to get jobs. So it's a question of balancing number of jobs uh, with you know lower pay. So my suggestion is, is it not, you need to pay living wage, but considering that MSMEs are not capable of paying a living wage, is it a rational thing to subsidize the MSMEs to be able to pay a living wage? And what much. should be the agenda for increasing employment, mass-based employment? Thank you. Do we want to answer these? Is there, are there any, are there any more questions? He's saying yeah. yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, no, no, no. That is not an easy question to answer. We are looking for solutions of various kinds. And, you know, just to give you what we've thought through in, you know, our manifesto for the Lok Sabha election, the last one, right? So um, uh, we talked about, for example, uh, the issue of climate change and whether we can create a whole new carder of people who are trained in... Uh, conservation in various other kinds of activities. I mean, it could be basic skills like rainwater harvesting, you know, we are working on uh, renewable energy technicians, you know, things of that sort. That there are actually, if you focused on some of these, uh, uh, you know, emerging domains, you might be able to create, um, uh, you know, you, you might be able to solve two problems, the jobs as well as the need to work on um, you know, mitigation uh, preparation for climate change. The fact that you know, that's one dimension of poverty that we didn't discuss, which is um, uh, you know, climate migrants. You're seeing development in Uttarakhand resulting in uh, you know, sinking of Joshiman, right? So you're seeing people losing their homes and uh, having, to, having to move out. So these are all, you know, some, we see the floods in Bangalore you know, someone, uh, you know, encroaches on the uh, stormwater drain, somebody else uh, finds their houses washed away, right? I mean, and, and this actually affected the rich as well, in the last set of floods that we had in Bangalore. But, uh, uh, but the basic point is, you know, that's just, I'm giving you one dimension. The other is to create, you know, we've moved into a services economy, but can we create you know, mass entrepreneurship. Basically, you know, the skill development programs, you know, for all the effort that we've put in under UPA and NDA have not been as successful as envisaged. Sector skills and, you know, uh, things of that sort. And um, so he here, do we train people to, uh, to become small business people? It could be, uh, you know, uh, the plumber who is able to go out there and um, uh, be rated and be contacted and <laughs> Whatever it is, right? Uh, so there's, there's just lots of trades, lots of small businesses, lots of services where people learn, need to overcome that mental barrier, poverty is a state of mind, that I can't do it, okay? And there is a caste dimension to this. I'll tell you, one of uh, the young uh, ladies who used to live as uh, part of our household help, when she was uh, moving on, we said, why don't we train you to become a hairdresser? Okay, and she said, she's from my community, she said, oh, we're Gaudas, we don't cut hair. I mean, so I was like, okay, and that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we're Shudras otherwise. It's not a big deal. But the opportunities to go back to your town and be, you know, run a beauty parlor or something like that, that was just wasn't, um, uh, you know, on her mind at all. I mean, we're offering to train her in a sustainable livelihood, and that uh, she just refused. So maybe uh, maybe do a bakery or something. Maybe that would have worked. So anyway, so these are um, uh, you know some aspects and uh, the challenge that we're facing now. It's not jobless growth. We're actually seeing job loss growth in the last few years. 
you know, numerous, uh, you know, uh, jobs are, people, you see the uh, CMI numbers, and you say, what's going on? You know, how are we going to fix this, right? And Especially with MSME and GST, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. GST itself costs, yeah. costs yeah. MSME yeah. distress. So demonetization and um, GST. If you would rather buy, um, uh, you know, from a formal entity, which can give you a GST certificate, uh, then uh, you would go with them rather than the possibly cheaper MSME informal supplier. You know, these sorts of things have uh, become a major problem. And the contract, the, the point that uh, the uh, environmental um, uh, leader mentioned, uh, <clears throat> you know, you saw uh, the Maruti factory where the contract uh, workers ended up actually killing. There was a riot and they killed the HR manager, right? I mean, in Manessa, we had this, uh, you know, that's the kind of tension that uh, exists. But, um, you know, this has become a constant practice. Essentially, very few permanent jobs. Everyone else uh, kept, uh, you know, on, in, uh, in temporary contract employment and uh, never becoming permanent, essentially. Not and just in those state sectors. Is, state is equally guilty of no, that, no, no. whether it's power karmikas, sanitation yeah, exactly. workers, it, you know, Anganwadi workers, teachers. Teachers, professors in Delhi yeah, University. They don't even get... <laughs> <laughs> Anything like that. Faculty, you see the same thing everywhere. So the railways is the biggest employer of contract yeah. Yeah. And they have no plans of regularizing. Yeah. 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 And they all also use manual scavenging. Yeah, in any case, the freebies argument, I, I um, uh, you know, that's a very tricky one. Because at this point, we have to create a social safety net. We've got to get, you know, when you think about Amartya Sen's point about capabilities, right? If you are poor, you're not able to think beyond survival. If you're unwell, you're not able to go out and create a livelihood for yourself. If you're illiterate, you're not able to, you know, engage, invest in your capabilities to go out and improve your uh, future. So these sorts of things are still so stark in, in India that we actually have to put in a huge amount of resources to make sure that people go beyond survival thinking. Now, the counter argument is, and this I hear from my farmer relatives, oh, you, you guys are just creating a whole bunch of people who no longer want to work. Okay, and I, I basically respond by saying, you know, nobody is out there who doesn't have aspiration of more wealth, more income, and if they've got the basics, they should be able to go forward. Now, you know, so there are other programs, like for example, we had these Indira canteens here, the Amma canteens in Tamil Nadu, which provide nutritious meals for 10 rupees. These are subsidized, right? But this is something that's hugely beneficial to migrant workers. And, it's uh, even more than that, Professor Gowda, because the way it was originally conceived, mm -hmm. whether it is the noon meal scheme in, in Tamil Nadu or the Amma canteens, the idea was that local women cooked mm -hmm. using local produce, right? So if millets or ragi was your local meal there in, say, North Karnataka, that is what would have to be used. That's also a source of livelihood for local mm -hmm. women. Now, in going to this modern, centralized, globalized, let's outsource it to a single entity that centrally makes it and transports it everywhere so that everybody gets white rice and, uh, you know, sambar, right? You've kind of okay. taken jobs away as well, right? I mean, there's an economic impact to this. So sometimes the efficiency and technocracy, right? I often like to say that in India, people are one app away from being disenfranchised. One app away from being disenfranchised. You ask for better public bus routes, people will come up with an app. Not that the bus routing changes, not that the frequency changes, not that more buses are added, not that bus tickets are more affordable, but people will come up with an app. And remember that the my household help has no smartphone to use the app, and she's the one that needs the bus. Right? Because if I don't get the bus, I'm going to just get a taxi. Right? But she needs the bus. And this is true for everything. It used to be that you could stand by the road and hail an auto. Have you, has anybody tried hailing an auto by the roadside now? It's, go, it, it's very difficult to get because they're all apt. Right? So you're constantly one app because this whole technocratic, efficiency-oriented thing that says, I'm going to outsource this to a centralized kitchen, basically means there's an entire ecosystem from climate change to local livelihoods, you know, that get affected as a result of this. So can I just quickly, yeah? So, Professor Gora, you just uh, talked of two things uh, which I thought I must add to. Uh, now we've been told uh, that even CMI 
data should not be used. Uh, let's not forget that. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, uh, we were, you know, I, I in my introduction, Akshay said I chair Navsarjan. Navsarjan is a Dalit movement in Gujarat, and they've precisely done what you were saying, bringing Dalit young uh, young people to the Dalit Shakti Kendra. Through the day, they are given skills in uh, non. Occupations which are non-traditional non for their caste, but in the morning and in the evening, they're still talking about Ambedkar, etc. And, and they're really trying to build a movement, let these Dalit activists go back to their villages. And they insist that please go back to your villages, so that you are also setting an example of occupation which is not caste-based, and then you continue the, uh, uh, the, the struggle on, on caste. I, I think your, your question, as Professor Gorda said, is a complicated one. And um, I would only say, you know, at this moment, you might think that it's a wishy-washy answer because it is really a complicated one, and I do not have uh, real answers to that because everybody is struggling. But in some ways, taking from what Tara said, the technocratic solutions, I think even economic, uh, you know, ad advised by well-known economists is not going to work. It's not technocratic solutions. We need political solutions and political solutions where people are at the center. You know, and, and we and have to think. Representative, Represent, from a representation. Yes, exactly. so people have to be at the center. Otherwise, power is going to get captured by the elites, and they will have, you know, uh, in, in different ways, they will eventually uh, corner the resources. The three other bits, very quickly, is poverty, a uh, state of mind. Absolutely not. As in, and uh, that's our fundamental understanding uh, that we, we do need to challenge. Poverty is clearly an outcome of the social structure, the economic structure that we have created. And I think we need to fundamentally challenge those structures. We have talked a little about caste. Gender is there. In this country, increasingly, you're looking at religion as another uh, very, very important factor. So poverty certainly is, is, as you know, the famous quote, that it's not being created by God. It's uh, created by humans. So, so we need to address it. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for uh, suggesting that we look at some more micro data. My, my request would be have a look at a report that we did two, three months ago on digital divide. So that's trying to give you some macro, uh, some micro flavor in terms of digital divide. We also did a report uh, uh, looking at uh, discrimination index, and and that will you know that's that's very startling, Tara, particularly uh, in terms of gender. That report was done by Professor Amitabh Kundu, and and he uses a decomposition method, which I'm told is used uh, universally now, where uh, they say that men and women starting at the same level. Have women have hundred percent discrimination uh, as the reason if for the inequality between men and women? Uh, so, so that's that's something again. So we are trying to go more granular, uh, but we'll continue working on it. And finally, the question you know, I just wanted to end with with that uh, in terms of disability and and the second question that you had. We do need an inter intersectional approach. We'll not be able to only focus on gender or just caste. It is about disability, gender, caste, ethnicity. We'll, we'll need to have an intersectional approach. And, and for that, just to end as an ultimately, and this is, I'm certainly not speaking entirely for Oxfam, but I do truly believe that the Gandhian dictum of putting the last first, uh, Antode, is, is central, you know, that, that Gandhian Talisman, that whenever you are in doubt, think of the, the weakest person and think of your action, is it going to help that person? And, and that's really the, uh, the, the direction that we need to take. Thank you. Um, Any close, Amitabh Ji, and thank you, Professor Gowda. And thanks for the to the patient audience for listening and your insightful questions. So with this, we conclude today's session. <laughs>